Thank the Lord for his presence and encouragement today. Uh, I appreciate so many of the things that have been said. I think they're a confirmation of thoughts and feelings that I have had. You know, Ben spoke about our walk as a walk of faith, but faith is something that has to be exercised. And, uh, you know, as I look at my own life, as I look at the life of churches, uh, ours and, and certainly across our land, I almost feel like at times we have institutionalized a kind of unbelief where there's a degree of disconnect between what we say we believe and what we actually experience. And I, I just sense the Lord wanting us to possess more of our possessions. Uh, you know, we, we, we use verses that are wonderful, like uh, Second Peter beginning there, where it talks about how the Lord's given us everything we need for life and godliness. And, uh, you know, through his great and precious promises, and we say, yea, God, I believe that. And, we, and, and I wonder how many times, how much of that do we live? And what's the, where is that disconnect? And how does that happen? Because, uh, you know, from time to time you, you encounter or you hear about Christians who just seem to live at a different level. And it's, it's like they must be different. Something must be, you know, maybe they had an experience. Maybe they're just some special somebody. And they seem to be able to just have a faith to, to see things happen, sometimes even to perform miracles. And that's not the point so much as the fact that there's a spirit of faith that just seems to be there that, uh, frankly, I would like more of. Uh, am, I, am I the only one? Uh, I, I believe God wants us to really, as I say, possess more of what we say we believe. It's awfully easy for us to to, to say that if, you know, we believe the word, we believe it, and, and it's in here, and we have a conviction that it's true, but somehow it never, or there's a, there's a breakdown when it gets translated into everyday life, uh, at least to some degree. And I, I, I just, I don't know, that's, that's just the burden of my heart. But one thing that has come to me repeatedly over the last few days, and uh, maybe I'll just preach to myself this morning, you can listen in if you want, but um, I'll start with a verse that's been referred to over the years. It's been a while since we, I remember it being read here, and it's in Proverbs chapter 18. There's a little wisdom from Solomon that I believe bears on what I've been thinking about. And it's in verse 21, and it's this, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And uh, putting that in its context, you back up one verse. From the fruit of his mouth, a man's stomach is filled with the harvest. From his lips, he is satisfied. Then it says the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So it's, it's evident to me that Solomon saw a connection between what we say and even practical things in life. Because he's talking about, you know, we, we eat the fruit of it. And I think it's more than just, uh, you know, feelings and, and something intangible. I believe it actually makes a difference in life. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a certain amount of this that has kind of filtered down into the natural realm. You go to uh, hear some of these uh, positive thinkers and, you know, some, you know, how to be a millionaire and that sort of stuff. And they'll talk about how you, you're supposed to talk yourself into it. You're supposed to have these affirmations and... Uh, I am really rich, I'm, you know, I'm great, I'm this, I'm wonderful, and as though that can somehow translate that into reality. There's a measure of truth, but that's obviously not the point <laughs> of what I believe the Lord wants to share with us. It's not about getting for self in this world, but it certainly is in, a, in participating in what God's purpose is for us as a people and as individuals. And uh, I believe with all my heart, God wants us to be more conscious, certainly me, of the role of the tongue in faith. You know, we were created in God's image, were we not? When God does something, how does he do it? He speaks, doesn't he? And I believe that that indicates something of the way God does work in, in, in and through us. That it's wonderful to believe something. It's good, it's great to have a real conviction and say, yes, I believe every word in this book. 
But there's a, uh, there's a way that that gets implemented. There's a way that that gets, as I say, translated into our lives that I feel like, certainly I can confess that many times I am, I'm, I'm stuck in an area of uncertainty and unbelief when it comes to the practical side of it. We pray and we sort of beg God and hope for the best. And Am I overstating that? Yeah, and I, and I feel like God wants to bring us to a level of faith where we can pray in faith. We can believe for needs in our lives in faith. We can believe for needs in others. And I believe God can bring a people to the place where when it's needful and appropriate, they can speak a word and see something miraculous happen. That's obviously not the point, ultimately. You know, there are some people who have gone to seed on this kind of thing, and it's the name it and claim it. As though, uh, you know, we're, we're little gods and God wants us to grow up and to be able to speak things into existence and we can, we can speak ourselves into prosperity in the world and success and, and all of that stuff. And, and it, it kind of takes hold of a principle and, and ultimately brings it over into the realm of self, sometimes into the realm of fantasy, you know, where people are going to go into a... I mean, I remember reading in Jim Symbol is one of his books where he's talking about folks that had a con convened a conference in a certain city and man, they were going to drive the devil out of out of that city. And they, it's like they had the power to come in there and just go through whatever they went through. And man, the devil was gone. I mean, that's fantasy. But, you know, I don't want to jump into the other ditch and say, boy, that's really wrong. Therefore, we just sort of live in an area of muddling through and unbelief and, and declaring that we believe all this, but not really see, ever seeing a whole lot. I want to see God at work. I want to see him at work in me. I want to experience the things that he talks about here to a degree that I haven't. And I want to be that kind of a people in an hour like this where we have a faith that actually works in the real world. It's not just that we... Uh, we believe it, but we actually see it. And, uh, you know, I thought of a number of scriptures. I'm going to ask the Lord to kind of put them together. But I thought of one that really shows the principle that I believe is involved here. And it's in Romans chapter 10. You know, Paul is teaching his way through the gospel and what it is in Romans 10. And, and he's talking about the, uh, the Israelites and how they thought that their relationship with God was established, with God was established through law. He gave them laws to obey, they obeyed them, and by that means they were accepted by God. And Paul says that's not it. That was a schoolmaster at best to teach us, to bring us to the place where we would come to, we would come through Christ and what he did. And upon that ground alone, we would find a place of acceptance before God. But uh, in, uh, let's see. The righteousness, verse 6, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. Now see, it needs to be in the heart, doesn't it? But it doesn't stop there. There's two parts to that. Now watch where it goes with this. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. So something has been proclaimed. It has resulted in a word that has penetrated into the heart. It's made a difference. It's brought about an understanding. It's brought about a conviction that something is true, that this message is true. Not only that, it's true for me. I need this message. It's a word from heaven for, to help me. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming that if what? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart you believe and are justified and it is with the mouth that you confess and are saved. That's pretty plain, isn't it? There's two parts to faith, in other words. It's wonderful to have a conviction in the heart, but there has to come a point where it is spoken. 
Just as God speaks and something happens, we are meant to speak if we are to actually bring the, the blessing into reality in our lives and ultimately we can affect other people by what we say and what we do. But oh my, we are so good at somehow we, we, we assert these things, but when it comes to really believing it, this is where we fall down. I don't feel good. Things don't look good. You know, I, we go by how we feel. We go by, we find all the fine print that the devil can kind of manufacture in our minds about why this doesn't apply to me now, this, you know, that and the other. Somehow we, we don't pray with any kind of real faith. We don't, we don't stand with any kind of faith. We don't really believe to the degree that God wants us to in the reality of what we say, namely that we have all things in Christ, we, he has provided a full and a complete salvation. You know, we, uh, we referred, I think, I think it was last week, to Paul's admonition to Timothy, and it was to fight the good fight of the faith. And I think in the King James, which is what I tend to remember, it says, lay hold of eternal life. There's something that has to be laid hold of. In other words, it's there, God says, I'm not going to just dump it on you. You have the responsibility. You have the part to play to actually take hold of that. And that's, you know, I don't know. I just, I just sense this. Why, why, are we in, why is there so much unbelief? Why is there so much unbelief? And I believe this is a huge key. It is a much bigger key than we have perhaps imagined. And it's not that we can just, in a sense of self-will, we can just decide, I want this to happen, and by, by God, I'm going to confess it into existence. I believe part of our relationship with God, certainly what he describes here is the establishment of a relationship with God. Namely, there is a conviction in the heart that is ultimately confessed. Jesus is my Lord. I believe in him. I, have, I, I absolutely believe what the record is of who he is, what he did for me. I embrace that, but I don't just embrace it. I confess it. Let me remember what, what was said of some of the Jews. In fact, it was, I think it was some of the Pharisees. I don't remember exactly, but it was in John 10, where Jesus spoke some words and it said many believed on him, but, but they would not confess him for fear of the Pharisees or the Jews. So somehow it got this far, but it never came out. It never really got sealed. Didn't seal the deal. And I, I, I find myself in this place where, oh God, I need this. I want this. And somehow there's something there that undermines the ability to absolutely say, I, devil, I stand on what God has said. I am what he says I am. He gave me what he says he gave me. And I am going to stake my claim on that. I'm not coming to you, Lord, based upon my merit. I'm not coming to you because I have earned this place or this privilege. You have given it to me and you have declared it to be so. You have declared this is mine. I claim it. And I'm willing to say it. I'm willing to come out and, and take a stand with my mouth that's positive. I don't want to be one of these that I believe it, but. And we do that, don't we? We have ways of undermining what we say we believe when it comes to us now. I'll tell you what, I, I just, I don't know. You know, I was thinking about, somehow my mind went to Angus Buchan. Some of you know who he is. He was faith like potatoes. Just a simple South African farmer. I went and listened to a little bit of an interview of him yesterday when he came to my mind. But just a simple man who came to the Lord and had the, and had the audacity to actually believe what this says. Scary, isn't it? And he would run into situations and instead of, oh well, must be God's will, you know, he would actually rise up against what was going on and, and just cry out to God. And sometimes he was, he was almost willing himself to take hold of this word. 
You remember that scene about the fire? There was an out of control fire and he was running around fighting the fire, but he was crying out and, and proclaiming the promises of God in the face of that. And God, and God sent a storm. And somehow the Lord has, has taken that simple farmer and given him a global ministry before sometimes hundreds of thousands of people. And he just has a simple faith to pray for people. He has a simple faith to be able to, uh, you know, to, to see somebody instantly healed. You know, that one, uh, one example, it wasn't in the movie, but it was in the testimony later where he, went, he was in a congregation, congregation, a conven anyway, there was a whole lot of people there, a meeting, and the majority of the people in that meeting were Muslims. And he's, he's laying it out there and talking about the power of God and how God is great. And the Lord kind of uh, talked to him about some man who was, who was crippled on the front row. And he went down to pray for him. And I think he had to pray for him a couple of times. But when it was done, the man was just jumping around. His legs were bending. And everybody was going crazy. And when he, real, when he was trying to find out what was going on, he found out that man had a steel rod in his leg. There was no way it was going to bend. I mean, God had completely undone and reversed everything about that and done it right in front of a whole crowd of people. Well, you can imagine how, what that did for faith in the gospel, which is the point. It's not to say, wow, that was a miracle. It's to, it's to authenticate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and I, have a, I pray that God will bring us to a place, maybe back to a place in a measure, where, where we see God at work in lives in a greater way than we do. It's not just the instantaneous miraculous, but God can do that too. And I, I want more faith like that. And I just pray that God will help us to begin to, to, uh, to take hold. You know, we have often used the, the case of the Israelites. And, and how they were taking the land and how, how it was such a, a, a half-hearted way in, at times. There were parts they just couldn't seem to get. And what happened was that they would go into an area, a certain tribe, and try to take it. And the, the inhabitants would resist them to the point where they, they believed in the resistance more than they believed in the promise of God. Now, we don't say that when we come in here and sing and say well, all these wonderful things that we sing about. But isn't that kind of true in our lives many times? We run up against something that just seems to be a, an intractable situation. We're just, we, we've been, it's been that way as long as we can remember. And instead of rising up and saying, devil, I don't care what you say. I am declaring the word of God. This may take time. It may, I don't know what God, how God's purpose is, but I'm going to stand in faith upon what God says. I'm going to, I'm not just going to hope so and believe it. I, and I don't want to just say brave words. I want to really marry up two things. I want to marry up a conviction in here and I want to marry it up to lip, to my lips in prayer and in confession. There's something, there's a principle that God operates. Now you can say all the right words and it's not in here. See, so part of the equation isn't there. But I believe that God can take us from where we are at, and I believe he can lead us, I believe he can impart to us a faith that will enable us to grow. You know, uh, you think about somebody like David, we've used him as an example often. And uh, David, of course, didn't, didn't start his career against Goliath. But he had some situations that happened that caused him, God, God caused him to exercise his faith. A lion and a bear come out, what am I going to do? Am I going to just surrender the sheep to the lion or the bear? Am I going to rise up and say, God gave me this job. I'm going to take, I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to do something. I'm going to put legs on my faith. And so he did that and God gave him the victory. And, you know, he was, he was brought to a point where he had what it took when the time came. And uh, praise God, I was looking for the, the scripture about Goliath. But notice when he went out to Goliath, he didn't just have this conviction, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, I know God's going to be with me. Man, he spoke it. He wasn't quiet about his faith. He put it into action. It was, there was the action, but man, there were the words. David said to the Philistine, this is in 1 Samuel 17, if you want to look it up, verse 45. 
You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will stand, will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Man, that's some, you know, that's pretty plain, isn't it? <laughs> See, he's not just, and, and I don't believe he's going in there just kind of blowing smoke. This isn't trash talk. This is something that has a foundation. Folks, we have a foundation. We don't have to invent happy talk just to get through life. We have something that God has done that is apart from you and apart from me. He's done it. He's laid that foundation for me and for you. So this day, the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Whoa. You know, I'd love to have that kind of faith too, wouldn't you? We face situations in... Well, I don't know, you know. Don't you think the Lord wants to lead us to the point where we can have a greater conviction and a greater faith in things? You know, I, I was thinking about something Brother Thomas said many times, and I know, you know those of you who were here will remember it. it. Talks about faith. What does faith do? Starts where it's at. It starts with where it's at, with what it has and with what it doesn't have. It just starts. And the, what I see in my own life is a need to, to begin to rise up and use this tongue in a positive way to build faith, to ask, to ask God to give me not only the conviction about what he has said and where I need to go, what I need to do, but to, but to back it up with what I say. I mean, you think about just some of the, some of the areas where this uh, affects us in prayer. How, how positively do we pray? Do we pray as, well, I hope something happens. I pray, Lord, I know they're sick. I'll just pray. God wants to bring us to a place where we can have a greater faith and a conviction. He told us to pray one for another that you might be healed. You know, one, one awesome thing that we need to be doing when we're praying, just for example, just to talk about that, is to pray the word of God. I mean, then it's not just my, me and my wishes about fixing stuff. Now it's, God, you said. Lord, I'm coming to you, but I'm coming to you because of a promise that you gave in your word, and I'm standing on that, and I believe it. Lord, you said. Now you think of Jacob, for example. He was going back from uh, his exile in, uh, anyway, modern, modern Iraq is where it was, and... Uh, he, he was coming back to, to, to Palestine, and Esau was coming out to meet him. Well, things weren't so great when he left Esau, and he was afraid for his life, especially when he heard Esau was coming with 400 men. This was a very real situation, so he, he did what he knew to do, but boy, he came to God, and he said, Lord, you said. <laughs> you said that you were going to bless me. You said you were going to bless my descendants. You, you said I had a, I have a covenant with you. And Lord, look, what, look what's happening. Oh, God. You see, he's coming on the ground of the word. He's coming on the grounds of what God had said. So it's not just, oh, God, I'm in trouble. It's, oh, God, I'm looking to you. Jeho Jehoshaphat kind of did that, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, they were facing this, this massive army that was, that was coming against the Israelites out of nowhere. They were just minding their own business. And suddenly this army comes on their border and, and, and Jehoshaphat goes to God, but he doesn't just say, oh, God, save us from our enemy. He says, God, you did this. God, you did that. God, you promised this. You promised that. We're your people. We're looking to you. Remember what Solomon prayed. Remember what you told Solomon when you established the temple here. Oh, God, we're coming to you on that ground of your promises. Lord, we don't know what to do. Our eyes are upon you. Man, that's a great, that's a great place to be. 
I'll tell you, we come to God in that kind of a spirit, God's going to be, be able to quicken his word and we're going to be able to have a fellowship and a knowledge of him that isn't just secondhand, yeah, I believe that stuff kind of thing. God wants us to have a real relationship with the living God that where we can grow in our faith. We can have the kind of faith that he's talking about there. And, uh, you know, some people who, who think about using the tongue in a positive way will, will imagine that we should never say anything that's, well, I get, let, me, let me backtrack. Some people will say, well, I need to be honest. Because things aren't going so good right now and I, and I don't feel good. So, Lord, you, you prize honesty. I want to be honest. Well, a lot of times what we do is call, what we're calling honesty is really kind of unbelief. Because we are, we may be asserting situations, but honesty tends to stay there. You know what I'm talking about? And I'll use David as an example. You will look at many of his Psalms and he will talk about Oh God, my enemies are all around me. My sins are before me. My, you know, this, that, and the other thing. I'm in a desperate situation. Oh God, you know, help me, save me. And, and, he'll, talk, and he'll, use, he'll talk about the situation with an honesty. But you'll notice something, he doesn't stay there. He'll, he'll lay out the situation and he'll say, But you are my God. But your faithfulness will never fail. But I trust in you, Lord. I'm looking to you. That's the kind of... See, there's a place to be honest. It's not that we fantasize. But there is a way to confess in the face of things that are very real. To confess God's faithfulness. To confess God's word and to say, God, this is where I'm standing. This is where I'm landing. And, of course, you think about Abraham. I mean, he certainly reached a point in his life where being honest would have said, we are too old. We ain't going to ever have a kid. I guess that must have been something. You know, we fantasized all that stuff. That wasn't really so. I must have misunderstood. But he didn't do that, did he? He remained strong in faith and he gave glory to God. That was the testimony of Scripture. Even though he had his, the challenges that came against his faith were real. The bottom line is what God is looking at. And the bottom line was he believed God. And God was able to step in in the face of something that was humanly impossible. Folks, there isn't a thing that we face that is, if we really saw the, the reality of what's going on in the world, we are in situations that are impossible. Every single one of us. We imagine that we can do this and do that and seize control and we struggle and we strive our way through life. But I, there's a God who longs to be real to us in greater ways and to lead us into a place of rest and confidence and faith. To where when we become aware of something, we can bring it with great honesty to God, but we can say like David, but you are my God. You will never allow your faithfulness to fail. You know, there was an honesty in Paul. He talked about many of the things that he went through and how and the desperation of his feelings. And, and you know, I was dis, I despaired, we despaired of life. There was this very real valley that he went through. But in every case, he winds up, he bottom lines it as God brought us through. God was faithful. God did this for a reason. There was this confession of things many times that were not, but, but God knew, that, but, but he was trusting in God to make them so. You know, we serve a God that we're told, I think it's in uh, Romans 4, who calls those things which are not as though they were. See, it's the creative power of the word. It's the power that we have to speak God's word and see it come to pass. You know, it's not something new, but we, I haven't, it isn't something that I've, it's really come to my attention in a long time, and I, I think it's needful right now. I believe it. I believe many of us have a hunger and a longing to know the Lord better. But there's a level, there's this kind of almost this institutionalized unbelief. You know, many times we travel overseas and we see simple brothers that have no more, no better sense than to believe God and they see miraculous things happen. You know, we, we say it that way. But the reality is they have sense. I mean, they know they're in greater needs. 
needs that we may, we, we may well experience going forward. But there is, there is a reality of people who have been thrown into the fire and they have trust, they have called on God and they have taken the choice in the face of feelings, in the face of experience to say this word is true. God's word abides forever. This world will pass away, but the word of the Lord stands forever. See, God has given us something that is a great deal firmer than what we plant our feet upon in this world. And I believe he longs for us to experience that. All that he's laid up for, all that Christ suffered for that we sang about this morning. Do we really believe that it is ours? And how much of it are we really enjoying? I wish I could come, I wish I could say there's an experience and if we'll just come down here, God will suddenly catapult us to this level where, oh my God, we'll just be flo floating above life and we'll, have a, we'll just be able to speak the word and the seas will part and the mountains will move. But I know that it's a journey, isn't it? It's a journey where we start where we're at and we say, God, teach me the ways of faith. Teach me how to take what you have said here and to translate it, not just in, in here as a conviction, but as a word that I am willing to speak. I'm willing to confess what you have said. I'm, I'll confess it in prayer. I'll confess it in testimony. I'm, and, and Lord, you can teach me and steer me through all of this and help me to grow and to learn. Help me to keep it within the, you know, within the boundaries of your purpose and your will. Not migrate off into some into left field where I'm trying to use you to, to fix me, fix life the way I want it. But Lord, I want to be a part of your, I want to be a participant. I want to take hold of the life that you have given to me. Like, like Timothy, fight the good fight of life. Lay hold on the, on the eternal life. Praise God. Do you believe that God, that this is real? Do you believe that God longs to take us to a place where we can do that. You know, most of us are stuck with, with needs and situations of our own. It's not like we can go help somebody else almost. I mean, we can speak a good, a good kind word and that's fine. But I think much, a lot of the time we are so struggling with our own needs and our own lives and actually trying to believe God for them. And here God is wanting us to become so grounded in his word and confident in him that even when we feel a need, we can be like David. I feel the need, Lord, but you're my God and I'm trusting in you. And there's that confession that takes us through, that actually opens up the channel where God's life can begin to flow in and fix that. Because there is no other solution. If God does not come and fix what's wrong with us, we can bellyache and complain about it all we want and struggle and strive. It ain't going to change. But salvation is of the Lord and his word is either true or it isn't. If it isn't true, if all the things that we've heard about throughout history, if that's all not true, then why are we here? And we can assert our beliefs in the, in the doctrines of the faith and the, the, the sufficiency of the scriptures, but there is more to it. God wants us to enter into something that will change lives. You know, there's people, there may be people here, and you've, 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 you've kind of reached a, a general conviction. Yeah, there's a God, Jesus died for my sins, and I need him, and I, sort of, I believe all of that. Maybe you need to come to the point where you're willing to, you're willing to stand up if necessary and say, Jesus is my Lord. I put, I put my hope and my trust in him. You think God would recognize that? I guarantee he would. But it's, it, it doesn't stop there. All that he has for us is obtained in through the same principles. Not, not as a formula, you understand what I'm saying. But there has got to be a point where we marry up real convictions that God has spoken into our hearts. And we bring them out through our lips and say, here I stand. Devil, this is where I stand. Man, there's a devil who, if you take up the sword of the Spirit. See, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty... Uh, Central thing, isn't it? How do they overcome him, by the way? The blood of the Lamb is what gives me a standing before God. I have a righteousness I didn't earn. My sins were blotted out because of the blood that was shed there, and my hope is in that, not in me. 
So I have, I have a right to stand before the devil as righteous as God is because of what he did. But you notice it doesn't stop there, does it? It's by what? The word of their testimony. There is, a, there is coming forth a confession. And I'll tell you, the devil recognizes when someone who has a conviction in the heart and is willing to stand up in the devil's face and say, devil, it is written. Kind of worked pretty good with Jesus, didn't it? In the wilderness. That was his answer every time. It was the ability to stand up and use the, confess the word to the devil. See, we need to start by confessing it to ourselves. That I believe what God says. We can confess it to the Lord. We can confess it to one another and use our tongues to, to edify one another. Use our tongues to encourage one another. Use our tongues as a vehicle to minister faith one to another. But I'll tell you, we can stand up to the devil himself and look him in the eye and say, God said. I'm not standing before you because I'm anything. I am an object of amazing grace. End of story. That's all. That's the only reason I have the right to stand here is because of amazing grace. But stand I will. I am not going to look at me under a microscope and find every reason in the book where I can't have confidence before God. You look in the scriptures and you will see how the, the confessions of, of, of Paul as he wrote to believers. I mean, he would write to believers and People that had all kinds of problems, all kinds of needs that he would have to address. But he said, you're God's chosen people. You are sanctified. You are the ones he's called through the hope of the gospel. You have an eternal hope laid up for you in heaven. I mean, this is, this is the confession of the reality of the word of God and where the gospel is going. It's not looking at the situation and saying, boy, you bunch of screw ups. See, he's focusing on what God has said. And what God has the ability to bring about. And so there's, this, there's always this exercise of the word of God. And I know that, it, you know, it, what, obviously he penned those things. But when he was there, he spoke them. Yes. He would address, I'm going to use one example here that we've often used. And that's in Colossians 3. And I'll just give you one example so I'm not just hip hopping around here. And he's been lifting them up and trying to turn them away from some things that, were going to, that, would, tend, uh, that would tend to sidetrack them. But anyway, he's talking about, well, right after he says, Christ is all and is in all, therefore, verse 12, as God's chosen people. Now Paul is looking at these human beings that are just like us, that had problems, that were, there was a, there was a challenge to their faith that was trying to sidetrack them. He said, you are God's chosen people. You are holy. You are dearly loved. Now, how many of us find it a little difficult sometimes to put ourselves in that category? We can assert this in a very vague, general way, but to say, I am one of God's chosen people. I have holy, I've been set apart for him. I am dearly loved. It's gotten quiet in here. Yeah. Is this an issue? Yeah, I got one yes. The rest of you are stunned. No, of course it's an issue. We allow the devil to paint us into a corner of, of personal condemnation, of something that, that somehow there's something about me that disqualifies me from being able to use this kind of language. Paul used this kind of language of the Corinthians. And look what was wrong with them. But he saw the power of the gospel to address every need, to meet that need, and to bring them all the way through to a place of glory on the other side. I believe in that gospel, don't you? I believe in the word of God. My faith is not in me. My faith is in his power to save me. And he's got a job, but he is up to that job. He is able to. To save completely those who come to God by him because he ever lives to make intercession for us. Praise God. We believe these things in, sometimes in here up to a point and in here up to a point. But oh, I, I just sense the need in myself to be a lot more positive with what I say. 
that kind of completes a cycle. Of, that, that just, those, those words have power if they, are, if they are ultimately powered by God's word. See what happens? God plants his word in the heart. But that word isn't meant to stay in my heart. That, may, that word is meant to become the confession and the stand of my lips. And I'll tell you, it comes into being just as God spoke and it happened. You see the pattern that's following there. Okay. Uh, clothe, okay, as holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. So obviously he's not basing what he's saying upon their performance at the moment. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of God, of Christ, rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Now listen to this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So now you've got the engine, now you've got the power, now you've got the source of it all. God has spoken a word. That word has entered into our hearts. It's, it's done something down here. It's breathed life. It's breathed conviction in here. So what? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. So what he's talking about here, what he's, the picture he's painting is this word coming out. Do you realize the power that we have is life and death? How, how much of the time do we speak death to ourselves and to those around us? I'm feeling bad. I'm getting old. I'm, you know, guilty. Things are bad. Things don't look good. I got this ache and that pain and this other thing. And Oh, praise God. I'll tell you what. Those things may be so in the natural, but they don't determine my destiny. They don't determine my relationship with God. He loves me. He's with me. He's worthy of my praise. He's worthy of my trust in the middle, as was said earlier, in the middle of the storm. It's not that we are looking for a, a free ride in this world. It's that we are, we are walking and living by faith. But faith that is not really spoken, that, is, that does not govern this tongue, is missing a pretty important ingredient, isn't it? Because Solomon said the power of life and death is in the tongue. And it's kind of going to be one or the other. And a lot of times we're speaking more death than we are life. And I, I just sense the Lord wanting to change my outlook and my attitude. I look at some of these people like Angus Buck and, and, and others. And there's just this, there's a joy, there's, a, there's an exuberance about, about the goodness of God. And there's a positive confession. God is faithful. God will work. God will change lives. And why is that missing in so many places? Why is it missing to the degree that it is in me? I believe God wants to teach us. I believe he's more than willing to teach us. This isn't just for special people. This isn't just for the special handful. This is the center of God's purpose. I'm going to go to a couple of scriptures in the Old Testament that we're looking forward. And I'm just going to just kind of skate over them because I don't want to, I don't want to get bogged down and, and miss what's you know, mess up or muddy the water. But I'm going to look just briefly at one thing that was, that was brought out in Isaiah 51. The prophecy in a time of, of great darkness spiritually in Israel, there was always that small, small remnant that looked to God. And the Lord was encouraging them. And I'm just going to kind of summarize. He says, look to Abraham. God is absolutely still for you. He's going to take care of business. Listen to my people. Pay attention, you who have my word in your heart. Don't worry, salvation is coming. I'm, I'm on the job. Uh, things are not always going to be as they are. You look around. You see the world that you're looking at. 
Everything you see is going to go up in smoke. But I'm the one who's created all things. I'm in charge and my purpose is going to, ha is going to happen. The ransom, verse 11, the ransom of the Lord will return and so forth. There's, there's just this sense of, of triumph and, and don't, don't react to men. Don't react to what you see in the world. And do we? <laughs> Certainly no, not much source of comfort out there. We see our, we see our nation circling the, circling the drain. Maybe starting down. I don't know where we're at, but I, it isn't good. But my hope is not here. I serve a God who will be here and his people will be here when, when this is all gone. And God wants us to know. He wants us to be a people who have a confidence in him that is practical. That's able to stand up against the darkness that is over, overrunning our world. But listen, listen to this amazing verse down in 16. I have put my words in your mouth. It's interesting, isn't it, to put it that way. I have put my words in your mouth and covered you with the shadow of my hand. Now, this is where you'll have translations that will vary, and several of them really follow it, I think, a little closer, where it says, I've done this in order to. I've done this to set the heavens in place, to lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, you are my people. What he's saying there is God wants us to be participants in his purpose. A lot of times we're sitting there struggling with our own little, in our own little problems, in our own little mind, our own little world, and God wants us to get such a place of faith and rest and victory that he can turn us around and use us to speak life, use us to speak his words. So his, we are participants in something that he is doing that's eternal. Where do we get this from? God puts his words, not just in the heart, but in the mouth. Look at a scripture over in, in fifth, chapter 59. You know, we often begin with 60, rise, shine, for your light has come. But look what happens before that. Talks about the Redeemer coming to Zion. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you and my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on forever. See, this is, a, this is amazing when you think, when you just kind of get, wrap your mind around this to a little bit, a little bit. God wants, obviously, people of conviction. But if we really have conviction, God wants that to be coming out of our mouths a lot more than it does. So that we're not saying, yeah, I believe this, but. So that we can pray for one another with a whole lot more positive faith. We can pray not feeling like we're under the circumstances. You know, under the circumstances, I'm hanging in there. Well, we're not supposed to be under the circumstances. We serve a God who is above all the circumstances. And even though we may have to endure circumstances at times, we can still have his joy. We can still have a positive outlook and a positive confession that will help to carry us through all of that and be a testimony to somebody else. What are we ministers of? That's power of death and life in the tongue. I believe God's word, but things are bad. Feeling bad. I'm depressed. I'm, you know... Those kinds of things will absolutely attack every single one of us if we will let him. But what do we believe more? Do we believe him? I'll tell you, there's a power in that word that he has given to us. It has the same power to create as it had in the initial creation where God said, let there be light and there was light. He said, let there be stars and there were stars. Let there be a world and there was a world. He didn't have to do anything else but speak. It just flowed. There was a power that flowed out of his word. That's the word that he speaks to us. And I'll tell you, for every heart that will embrace what he has said and confess what he has said, it's going to change us. It's going to change others. Because I'll tell you what, there's another scripture in Isaiah 50, 55 that talks about the word that goes out of his mouth. What does it say? It will not return 
empty, void. But it will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. I know I'm not the only one. I know there's a reason the Lord has laid this on my heart. I don't, want to, I don't want us to slide into what was described earlier as a form where we learn how to say all the right things and, and, and agree with our minds as to what we believe and all of that and, what, and how we do things. I want us to have the real thing. I want him to be the head and the Lord in practice, not just a figurehead that we somehow refer to up there. I want him to dwell here. I want him to change hearts and to change lives, starting with mine. And I want my tongue to participate in that more than it does. Instead of being negative and being down and focused and talking about all the bad stuff, to, to be able to say, Lord, you're on, yeah, it's, there's a lot of bad stuff, but you're on the throne and I praise you. I believe you. I believe your word in the face of everything that I am experiencing. I'll tell you, the devil's going to challenge every one of you here, and, and starting with me. But we have the right to stand up and look him in the eye. You know, that, like that song, He Has Forgiven Me? Yes. We have the right to look the devil in the eye and with, and with that same kind of confidence say, this is what God says. You say this, but along with Jesus, but, but the word of God says, and this is where I stand. I'll tell you, you want the devil to run? You stand on the blood, you stand on that, and you stand... You stand the last part of that verse in Revelation 12 is, and they didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Well, my life is, is yours. You know, whether I live or die in this world, I'm yours, Lord. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I'm willing not just to quietly confess it in, or believe it in my heart. I'm confessing Jesus is Lord. He is who he says he is. He's, gonna, he's doing what he says he's going to do, and my hope is in him 100%. Man, I'll tell you, there's no defense, there's no, there's no, nothing the devil can do about that. Because there is a foundation that lasts forever. So, praise God, I'll just, I'll just lay this out there and, and just pray that the Lord will take it for every one of us. I've sensed just thinking about this. You know, uh, there's something that's done to my own spirit to kind of rise up and say, wait a minute. I'm just sitting here letting the devil beat on my mind and, and dwelling on circumstances and coasting along and being sort of, you know, just going through the motions when I need to be rising up and saying, praise God, he's on the throne. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, all the confessions that we, that we know from the word. But God wants to take the step by step through his word and bringing it into reality in our lives. Do you believe that he's willing to do that? You willing to confess that he's willing to do that? <laughs> Praise God. Praise the Lord.